Um, so we know, of course, that human health is deeply connected to the health of the earth and its systems. Why is it important to keep these interconnections at the forefront? And how is it that the National Academy of Medicine is centering this concept as part of its grand challenge? Well, let me first say how exciting it is to be at this crossroad. Amanda, kudos to you. You know, this, um, this initiative is really one of its kind across all the three academies called Crossroad. We are really working together to make sure that we address the issue of climate change. And there's a whole spectrum of perspectives. You heard my interest, of course, is health and medicine. So in your question, I think about the following. Human beings, in many ways, are, in fact, influencing the health of the Earth is your question. But the health of the Earth is also greatly determining the health of the human being. And I say, if you think about what's going on, and you, I'm sure you talk in great detail about all the extreme events, Hurricane Barrow, and the extreme heat outside, <laughs> thank God we get air conditioned, and there are many others, you know that, in fact, uh, this is a phenomenal problem. But at the end of the day, if you think about what that all means to us, I think for all of us, health and well-being is the key issue, right? When people think about climate change, they talk about it in terms of environment. I see images of a polar bear and shrinking slab of ice, but I think what we're not emphasizing enough is that it's affecting and hurting all of us. And in fact, from my point of view, of course, it's affecting people's health. The range of uh, impact, you know, you, when you look at extreme weather and wildfires, indeed we have, uh, you know, people dying from it. But I think when you think about what climate health is really doing, the range of health impact is cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, infectious disease, mental health, extreme heat, all that stuff. So if you look at the stats, the impact on climate change and health is huge. Globally, it's in tens of millions of people die a year. From air pollution alone, five million is related, in fact, to fossil fuel. So clearly, it's a really important issue. Now, we got involved with this because back in 2020, many people were asking, what are you doing in this area? Because if, you, if people only realize that's affecting their health and well-being, maybe there's a lot more action towards it. But also, we also recognize that we have to be good citizens and play a real important role in looking at how to mitigate, adapt to climate change. And hence, we had this idea of this grand challenge. The grand challenge is a part of this climate crossroad is focused on health. And really, it's mobilizing public-private activities. We've gone together pretty much, I would say, you know, the private sector, the public sector, academia, hospitals, industry, you name it, to all come together to say, let's really tackle this issue. Why? First of all, we recognize, you know, people, as I said, are dying from this. And it's not a U.S. issue, but it's a global issue. When you think about drought, famine, flood, you know, climate refugees, poverty, you name it, it's a big issue. So we thought about five areas we work on, and this is chaired by Judy Roden, who's the former uh, president of Rockefeller Foundation, University of Pennsylvania as well. So first, communication. Let's get the message out there. Let's just make sure people know that climate change is affecting your health, not only your grandchildren, but your health, your parents' health, it's affecting everyone around you. And that, secondly, it's a real public health crisis. By all measures, we know it's a crisis. Also, we also know that climate change particularly affect those populations which are more vulnerable, those people who live in more, shall we say, low socioeconomic environment, and globally in low-income countries where they have the brunt of climate change effect, but they are actually the least culprit 
of all things. So it's an equity crisis as well. So that was one. So we're working towards how to get the message out there. We're working with uh, Climate Commission Initiative of the National Academies, but also with many others to get the message out there. And it's not only talk to people like ourselves, but talking to people who are, in fact, not believers, but now really putting, you know, the emphasized fact is affecting health. Education is a key issue in our communication effort. Because we recognize that in order to be able to be good messengers, we ourselves have to be educated. So we have a major initiative looking at education of health or health professions and biomedical researchers for them to be able to take the message and also walk the talk themselves. The second area of our grand challenge really looks at our own role in mitigation <laughs> and adaptation. You may or may not know that health sector emits 8.5% of carbon, of total carbon in the United States. That's amazing if you think about this. Now, a good part of it is related to how we deliver care, and a good part of it is due to supply chain and manufacturing. So we have put together a major initiative to bring together some 200 organizations, public-private, to look at how we can work together. Co-chairing this initiative is uh, Assistant Secretary of Health, Rachel Levine, myself, and now Senator Bill Frist just joined us to co-chair, as well as uh, the supply chain, former CEO of supply chain, Cardinal. So together we have looking at how to change the practice of healthcare to reduce the use of uh, energy and carbon emission. Changing the way that we do care, for example, moving to more virtual care, right? Looking at redesigning the care pathway. A huge amount of source of carbon emission is waste in, you know, if you ever go to emergency room uh, or to the operating room, you can see the amount of gowns and PPEs, you name it. So waste reduction and the seizure gas, many others. And of course, you know, low uh, carbon uh, footprint and facilities. The other part that we are looking at is how to get private industry engaged, look at the supply chain and manufacturing. And there we have the CEOs, in fact, involved with all those. The third area is really looking at uh, education I talked about. And the final area is really interesting because it's called policy and uh, incentives. Here we have Don Berwick, who actually is, you know, a guru in health that started the whole movement of you know, patient quality and safety. We have Liz Fowler, who's the head of uh, Medicare Innovation, and we have John and John Berlin, who is the Health Joint Commission. And what they're now doing is begin to say to hospital, we need to certify you, eventually we need to measure how you're doing. And CMMI is talking about incentives to change the way they pay people to measure outcomes as well. And importantly, we have started a movement uh, actually, we launched it in April that now have about all told 700 some hospitals, part of systems, all sign up to say, yes, we're going to start moving towards low carbon climate and health issues. Finally, we're doing research and innovation. We're doing a, looking at research gap and creating agenda uh, supported by Rockefeller as well as Kaiser. And we look at equity. As you heard some of you to an early session, we're working directly with communities which are at high risk and trying to help them co-design solutions. Victor, I'm so glad you uh, put communication at the top of things. And now we're going to have a little communication challenge. All right. Because we're going to try to fit uh, three other questions into the remaining about five minutes. So I've taken it all your time. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I think you touched on many of these. So uh, for instance, you know, we, we were just, you were just laying out the grand challenges very ambitious, um, delightful to hear of you thinking of it in such an interconnected way. Can you talk about some of the big roadblocks or hurdles um, that you and others in the healthcare industry must overcome oh, yeah. to decarbonize the health sector? Absolutely. Well, if you talk to my friends who are running hospital health system, they say, God, we're overwhelmed after COVID-19, workshop shortage, and half the hospitals are in the red in the last year. 
So they say, do I need to take on something else? So that is really an important issue. So we need to get them to say, not only is it worthwhile, but there's a business case for doing it. And in fact, one of our products is to actually do the business case to show, and there are really good data to show that if you did the right thing, over time you save huge amount of money by using alternate sources of energy. You look at better patient outcomes, right? And particularly patients like it because virtual care is a great thing. So I think people are buying it. And that's why when we do have seven, some hundred hospitals, I think they're getting it. There's a lot more to be done. The industry side is also very difficult. When people have to measure and report, they get all very nervous about, oh boy, I'm going to be held accountable. And while the industry said, we are really going to do this, they say, what's shareholder going to say? We don't meet our goals. So they're a little hesitant. They are working on solutions. But I think these are the major barriers. You know, it's like changing the way that people have done things for a long time. Thank you. And, and also building on that, so um, what's the role of health pr practitioners in speaking to their patients about climate change? And is there a training that they can get for that? Oh, I think absolutely. As I mentioned in the very beginning, it's key. Because if we don't believe and we don't really understand, we don't practice, then, of course, people would, don't trust us and say, why should we do this? So we are working with WMC, which is the medical college, uh, you know, the accrediting medical college, nursing, and others to look at curricular changes to be sure that everybody gets that education and being able to not only tell patients about these things, but also practice, right? The price I talked to you about. Thanks so much. Um, so throughout the summit, we really want to highlight where there are exciting innovations um, that hold promise for addressing the climate crisis, obviously. So I'd like to end by asking, what gives you hope? Well, okay, look at this audience and look at what Amanda's doing. I think we are now getting a message out there. Now for health, I think it's very exciting because finally at COP28, they acknowledged health and gave it a health day. On the Earth Day and week, we actually convened the first health and climate day. And of course now the coming week, they're gonna have a track on health. So what that means to me is a message is getting out there. People begin to get it. Used to be my friends tell me, well, you know what? We feel so lonely. We talk about health, nobody really cares. But I think now everybody cares about this. So I think the, to me, the collective action is what gives me tremendous uh, encouragement. People are getting it. They are coming together. They're working together. There's no way any one sector can solve this problem. We have to all work together. Thank you. That's a great note to finish on. Uh, we're going to continue to build on these themes of the health of the planet and its people in the next session, a panel, uh, which is moderated by my uh, colleague on the advisory committee, Teddy Potter. But I hope you will now uh, join me in thanking Victor for a Thank wonderful you. conversation. Thank you.